Happy holidays, everyone. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We're going to celebrate the season today with a bit of good news for all of us, and that is that there's ways to be healthy and still enjoy all the great things that this season brings. To chat with us today, I've reached out to some amazing experts to talk about everything holiday health. First, we have someone who's very familiar to us on the show, and that's registered dietitian Adriana Smallwood. She'll help us navigate eating better without giving up all of our treats. Next, we have Dr. Mashari El Washmi, who's an expert in digital health. He's going to walk us through some gift ideas on wearable technology. And lastly, we have Julie Dwyer, who's an expert in psychology. She's launched a new free community meditation program for those that are finding this very strange pandemic Christmas a bit harder than usual. We have lots to cover, so let's check it out. Adriana, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me back. This is a pretty intense time of year when it comes to eating healthy. People, uh, although they won't be going out as much as they might have in previous years, people are going to be going out and having big dinners and there's lots of sweets around. Uh, How do people navigate proper nutrition during the holidays? I I think it's really important to let yourself enjoy the holidays because I think so many people are cognizant of their health all year long. They get stressed out over the holidays because, you know, all of this food is going to be around. But I think the most important thing is to be able to enjoy your favorite things. Like how many memories over the holidays involve like a particular food, like your grandmother's cake or, you know, your friend's dip. Like there's so many things about the holidays and it's the things that you're doing most days of the week that impact your health. Not those couple times a year or once a week that are going to, you know, cause an increase in your weight or potentially increase your blood pressure. It's it's the things that you're doing every day that impacts your health. So it's important to be able to enjoy yourself too. Mm. I, I, I agree with that too. I mean, food is a big part of the year and uh, there's other things we can do. We're talking about that in this episode anyway, so we can be good in other ways. But what are some of the biggest pitfalls that people will face when it comes to poor nutrition, specifically over the holidays? I think everybody's busy. So yeah. I, I find The biggest thing is that people end up skipping meals. So then the only food they end up having might be that, you know, treat in the evening or like a big supper where it might be a potluck and there might not be as many healthy options available. So, you know, really finding the time to make sure that you are not skipping those meals and you're getting the good nutrition during the day. So those extra little calories in the nighttime don't really matter. And the other thing too, I find is that if you're skipping meals, you end up overindulging. So you're going to be end up eating more of those, we'll say unhealthy, air quotation, foods because you're starving and that's the only food available. So, you know, it's better to make sure you're pacing yourself throughout the day. So when you get to that, you know, those treats, you're only having little bits and having proper portions as opposed to like way too much food. No, that's a great, I mean, you know, you eat before you go out, then when you have something that tastes good, you're having it for taste, not because you need the calories because you haven't eaten all day long. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Hung, hunger sometimes takes a little while to kick in. Um, so sweets are a big thing for people. What should people be aware of when you have sweets? Because I know they could spike your blood sugar and they cause it to drop and things like that. So what, what are some of the challenges people will face with that? I mean, yes, that's the thing too. Like there's not just people going into the holidays that are worrying about putting on weight, but there's people who are worried about their blood sugars because they have diabetes or um, their blood pressure because they have high blood pressure. So it's, it's really important, especially with, I I think a lot of people are concerned about their blood sugar. So I often tell people, you know, if you're going to have like something sweet, make sure you're having like a protein with it, for example. So Mm -hmm. a chocolate with nuts. So like chocolate covered almonds, you know, if you're going to have Um, some chips, maybe throw in again, like some salted nuts with it. It's all salted, you know, that could break your blood sugar, but making sure that you're keeping everything stable, um, is the most important thing because if you're going to have, you know, like a cookie and it's all sugar or chips or pretzels or something that's all carbohydrate, um, there's nothing wrong with that. You want to be able to enjoy those treats, but making sure that you're adding in, you know, something high fiber or something, you know, high in protein to try and make sure that your blood sugar stays a little bit more stable. Mm-hmm. Um, that way you still get to enjoy that treat, but you're making sure that your blood sugar is not going to spike out of control and, um, you know, cause you to feel not very well or mm-hmm. throw off your, your health, right? Right. I mean, there's lots of ways to get healthy proteins in over the Christmas holiday. You get ham or or fish or you get a uh, big turkey and you can fill your plate full of some of that stuff too and take some of that room away from the starch to make it a little better. 
One thing that people really struggle with, I know they do, is alcohol because, you know, there's more drinking and socializing and things like that over the holidays. Uh, so from a nutrition standpoint, what are some things people should be cognizant of? Um, you know, and that's another thing, like people don't really realize how much uh, alcohol impacts their calories. And and I find especially this year, because, hey, it's 2020, people are home, you know, they're enjoying life. So they're, you know, drinking more wine. Um, you know, there's the 20, the COVID 20. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of people talking to me about that. I'm like, you know what, it's okay. But, you know, start thinking now about long term. So Alcohol seems like to be the big one. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a casual drink. The Heart and Stroke Foundation recommends between one and two drinks per day for women and two to three for men. So one drink would be considered a five ounce glass of wine, a one and a half ounce of distilled liquor or a 12 ounce beer. So keeping that in mind, anything more than that. And even I've had people ask, well, can I save it up if I'm not drinking all week? <laughs> but the problem is if you drink more than that recommended intake, it can increase your blood sugar. It can mm. increase your blood pressure. It can have impacts on your liver and other things. And aside from that, putting all that aside, the calories from alcohol aren't utilized as well in our body as protein, um, carbohydrate, and fat. So more likely those calories are going to be stored. Mm. Um, so you know, it's almost better to have that cookie than the glass of wine sometimes. Right. Well, I mean, think about some of the mixes that people put in with their with their alcohol as well. That could be a huge source of calories. Think about like things with milk or eggnog and, and sodas and things like that. How can people cut down some of those other calories? Um, I think like, oh, there's so many good waters out there now that have like nice flavors that don't have as many calories and they're, you know, they're bubbly. So they're giving you that little bit of pop that you're missing just cutting down, like I said, on the amount of drinks you're having, choosing lower fat milks. Um, so like if you're going to have your eggnog, I've noticed they have a lot of plant-based options now. So there's like some coconut eggnog, there's almond eggnog, and those are going to be lower in fat. And I've tried them just so that I could recommend them. And I have to say they're really good. <laughs> mm. And they're not as like heavy in your stomach because they're plant-based. They're not dairy-based. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with having eggnog, but I mean, if it's going to be something that you enjoy and you're having frequently throughout the holidays, maybe you can mix it half and half with the plant-based one. So it's not as heavy and not as um, high in calories. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, try and try some of those waters that are, I guess, bubbly is one and a few others. They taste yeah. really good. Yeah. Well, they good. taste good mixed with alcohol and keeping in mind that some of the mixes are really high in sugar. Mm -hmm. So keeping those smaller, sticking to like one, two single ingredients. Right. And, and and another thing is, like you said, it's about enjoying the holidays. Like I always say that it's not what you eat between the holidays and New Year's, it's what you eat between New Year's and the holidays. So you've got 11 months of the year where you can be, you know, better and, and enjoy it. But what are some things people can do to get in a mindset? Because undoubtedly, everybody decides to be a little bit healthier in January. I'm not a huge New Year's resolution fan. But what are some things people can do to be a little bit aware of getting ready for the for the upcoming year and the end of the holidays? I think being more mindful like, of their eating would be like the, the best way to start. I mean, there's people I think that fluctuate between I'm not going to do anything over the holidays. And if they like even have a little bit of an indulgence, they really stress out. And then there's people who totally let themselves go and say, I'm going to eat whatever I want because it's the holidays. So, you know, just like thinking, okay, you know, this is one month, but it's important to not overindulge every single day. Um, mm -hmm. Because like I said, it is the things that you're doing most days of the week that are going to impact your health. Um, thinking about, okay, so this year we're not visiting people as much, but you know, if there's like a house that you're going to go to, like you're visiting with your grandmother, you're visiting with your parents, think about your favorite thing. So, you know, if there's a cookie that you like at your nan's house, just have that cookie. Like don't try like the three or four other things, just focus on your favorite things and not eating things just because they taste good. And then you can say like, okay, you're going to go visit your parents. Okay. Well, you can have your favorite thing there. So keeping in mind that, you know, you can still enjoy things, but don't go eating just for the sake of eating mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, it will add up. And, you know, January is a fresh start. Um, you don't really want to have to worry about everything over Christmas that you've done. And I find that so many people stress about that. So mm -hmm. You're supposed to set yourself up for, you know, winning, not for failure. So make sure you're setting goals and doing things that you're not going to regret. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 
that's the biggest thing, you know, make sure that you're going to win at the end of this and you're not worried and stressed about what you've done over the holidays and you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I really encourage people to do is have a tradition that involves an activity, Ah. you know, everything's eating. So, you know, all your favorite things involve food, but there's so many nice outdoor activities that we can do here. There's, and they don't cost money. You know, you can do the skating rink at, um, at the park. They Mm -hmm. have the loop now at Bandaman park and I know Pippi Park has skis that you can go borrow that, you know, you don't have to pay for. They're always there. You can go walking in the snow. You can go snowshoeing. Like, come up with a nice tradition. Go to Barry Park. Uh, walk around and look at the lights. Like, there's so mm-hmm. many beautiful things that you can do in our town that don't cost money for people who, you know, might be struggling this year. You know, and it's a good way to work off some of those, you know, holiday calories that yeah. it's just time to spend together. But it's exercise, too. That's awesome. One of the things that I've always struggled with uh, personally when it comes to healthy eating is drinking water. How important would water be over the holidays? Is that something people can do that takes zero effort, doesn't keep them from depriving stuff? I think that's a big one. And, and always having like maybe like a nice water bottle with you because another thing that leads to hunger that people don't really realize is sometimes being dehydrated mm. or drinking you know, extra alcohol or extra pop, um, craving that little bit of sweetness because you're not hydrated enough. And that's another way to cut back on your alcohol. So if you're having sips of water in between drinking like your wine or your rum or your eggnog, um, it helps keep you full. Plus it helps quench that little bit of thirst that you're having. So you don't end up overindulging on sweets or really on alcohol. And staying hydrated is probably going to help the next day, just, you know, in case you have a little hangover. (laughs) Yeah, no, I've heard of those. So uh, winding up here, because we're hitting all sorts of topics today in today's show, but any last words? Yes. You know, enjoy yourself. Don't be afraid to have your treats. Just be mindful. Keep your portion sizes smaller and just enjoy the holidays because 2020 is going to be gone in a couple of weeks. And I think that we need to make sure that we celebrate it in style. That's great. Well, in our small bubbles, we can celebrate together and have a few treats and not feel guilty about it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Have a great day. Happy holidays. You too. That was registered dietitian Adriana Smallwood talking about holiday healthy eating. When we come back, we'll talk digital health tech gift ideas with Dr. Mashari El Washmi. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. I'm here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Mashari El Washmi. Dr. El Washmi is a pioneer in the area of digital health technology, working more than a decade in the field and introducing new technologies to traditional medical practice with a huge focus on the patient experience. Now, he's the chief scientific officer at Breathe Suite and works nationally and internationally as a mentor and advisor for various health technology initiatives. He's spoken about digital health and health hacking at MIT, Harvard, and the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies. So he is the best person to tell us about why monitoring our own health with some easy-to-use wearable technology could be the best present our health gets this year. Welcome to the show, Mashari. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Well, listen, you're the right person to talk to about this topic, and that is digital health. There's a lot of devices that are out there that people can use to start understanding their health better. But uh, maybe you can explain to the listeners about your background and why I wanted to talk to you about this topic. So I've used technology as a tool to improve wellness, prevent diseases, and also in the management of chronic diseases, several of them, including diabetes, asthma, and chronic obstructive ulnary disease, or we call it as COPD. I also recently published a, a paper about how we can use technology in the detecting, detection and management of COVID, and that was used by several researchers and organizations, including the World Health Organization. But I would say the three major projects that shaped my experience in digital health were, the first one was the work I did with Sequence Bio, which is a data-driven biotechnology company that is looking at the unique genetic makeup of Newfoundland and Labrador to discover medicines and also improve how we treat and prevent disease. The second project was the work I did uh, to get my PhD. I worked with nurses, pharmacists, uh, physicians, and also patients to understand how we can use smartphones and different technologies to manage chronic diseases. And uh, the last project which shaped my experience in digital health is my current work with BreathSuite. Mm, That's an interesting project, the BreathSuite. You and the team developed a pretty novel technology. Walk me through that. And so, as you know, there is about 90% of patients making error when they're taking their inhalers, which could reduce the effectiveness of medication. 
And uh, our team created a platform that includes a mobile application and also an inhaler add-on device. So it's like a Fitbit, but for your inhaler. So it automatically tracks not only when patients use their medication, but also it takes if they take their medications correctly or not. Then all of this data is sent to an app and patients can get personalized coaching on how to take their inhaler. And they can also monitor their adherence and medication and all of that results then can be shared with their trusted healthcare professional or family member. That's awesome. And that's really what this is about right now. There's so much technology out there that never existed when I first started in the wellness business. And people can use that information in a variety of ways. And people are looking for gifts. So maybe you can explain a bit about how the health technology is sort of integrating itself into fitness these days. Um, So the best way to understand how technology is integrated with our health is a concept that's called a digital twin. So currently, each person have a digital twin. Right now, it's made of your medical care records, but that digital twin is getting smarter and richer, uh, richer as we continue to integrate these unique data sources from these wearables and fitness tracking devices. So there is also more data that's coming from your genomic makeup and data from your diet and physical activity when you use apps to in- include what did you eat and how much you exercised. Then all of that data is going to help us and predicting outcomes for specific procedures, predicting what the right therapy is for each patient, and also can help us in preventing and managing different diseases and living better eventually. Mm. And and so some of these technologies are ones, like you said, where you put data in, you can track your food, you can track what you've done for activity, but some of them are sensing technology. How does the sensing technology really work? So it's it's fascinating how humans can be very innovative and they use these sensing technologies because it's much more usable than going in and entering the data yourself. So it's much easier uh, user experience. So some of these consumer facing technologies like uh, wearables and you know Apple or watches or the Fitbits have been used a lot recently. So Stanford just demonstrated that an Apple watch can help detect atrial fibrillation. Mm-hmm. And another study they did with the Apple watches and they were be able to lead uh, they use these watches to lead to quicker diagnosis of viral illnesses like COVID, which better informed public policy. And another fascinating example is, is a, a company called Deep Mood. So what they did, they actually predict depression with high accuracy just based on how a person used their smartphone keyboard. So pretty much uh, their texting pattern. And lastly, what we hope to do with, with pre-suite, we're actually hoping to integrate data from, uh, let's say, weather sources to be able to and predict lung attacks before they actually happen. Wow. Wow. And that's, that's important stuff. And this technology was really kind of had different roots. It started in medicine, for example, or in elite athletics. How is that being transferred from those fields into the general population? It's fascinating, actually. Yes, you can see that it, it, it was used by different sports teams, for example, to monitor the, the heart rate and the respiratory rate and how these teams can perform better. It was used by you know, to, to enhance the safety of workers, such as firefighters and miners. But it's now even used locally. So there's a local program in Eastern Health that's called the Remote Patient Monitoring Program. They're using a scale and um, blood pressure monitor, and th- that program is used, and it's it's actually helping to... Uh, reduce hospital visits and improve health outcomes. Mm-hmm. But now we were seeing a lot of employers actually using that to improve wellness. So I published a study last year about a program that's called the Digital Diabetes Prevention Program. And it was a program that used these technologies and was able to prevent type 2 diabetes through a significant reduction in body weight and increased physical activity. And, 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 you know, last time uh, we were hanging out, I noticed that you had different wearables on. You were trying out yourself. What are some of the wearable technologies that, that you use and that consumers could buy if they're looking for a Christmas present or a holiday gift for somebody? So I'm a big fan of uh, technologies that are easy to use. They don't require a lot of charging, look good, of course, and also uh, multifunctional so that they track more than one physiologic measurement. So One big one or that's becoming very popular is the Apple Watch. So I can monitor my physical activity. It reminds me to get up as I work on a disc all the time to go in and, you know, reduce my sedentary time. It captures advanced information about my heart and lungs, even which was fascinating. uh, When I wash my hands, automatically a timer starts to count for 20 seconds to make sure that I'm washing my hands properly. And it was fascinating to see how that changed my behavior with that. And, um, Another technology that that I like is a ring that's called the Aura Ring. 
it's used by the UFC fighters and used by the NBA also to track sleep, heart rate, and respiratory rate. But most importantly, they're using it to detect early signs of COVID because it has a temperature monitoring on it. I would say another good example of uh, a technology that can be purchased and it should be in every home is the weighting scale. So it monitors your weight and also body composition, such as fat, muscle, and bone mass. So you can have um, an objective measurement of your body. I think that's so critically important for people, especially because we all know we're going to be taking on news resolutions or trying to get fitter as the new year approaches. But if you're looking at one measure like weight, for example, which we all know is not the best measure when it comes to assessing whether or not we're improving our physical health, having something like that scale or having these digital devices allows us to have more variables. And how does this input and feedback to the user impact their behavior in your experience? So it's great to go by how you feel about your fitness, but you know, having tangible data removes the guesswork out of the equation. So you'd build your own baseline of what your weight is, what your physical activity is. It will hold you accountable and empower you to take action. It also allows better communication between you and your coach so they can see how you're progressing over time. And there is a growing number of research that points to the benefits of using health technology to improve that. And, and the act of monitoring itself is leading to positive behaviors. Mm. Yeah, I've heard the saying that there's four stages of learning. There's unconscious incompetence where you're, you're completely unaware of what you're doing wrong. Then there's conscious incompetence where you start to become aware of what you're doing wrong and then conscious competence. And then eventually there's unconscious competence. So essentially, the more information you have to know you're on the right or wrong path, it allows you to get on that right path easier. There's so many different variables they look at, but can you walk me through what some of the key variables that, for example, you would use? I know you exercise a lot, but I'm sure sleep is important. What are some things that people can get when they look at these wearable technologies? So I think the key things, what Apple is making it really easy for people to do, get actionable insight from is, is the rings, for example. You'll have the steps, for example, is a good measure for your physical activity. Um, your when you step on your scale, it will give you your weight, but it will also give you your body mass intake, which is the relative number of your weight and height together. I think that's that's an important measurement to make sure that you're following over time. But there are other, depending on if you have other chronic conditions or not, other metrics would come into play for the end to be important to monitor. So it looks at the physical activity. It looks at how many times did you stand or not as you're standing time. It, it captures advanced information about your heart and lungs. So over time, if there is something wrong with your heart, you'll get a notification so you can be more proactive and go to the hospital instead of waiting till you actually get sick because we're moving to a different kind of healthcare, a different model of healthcare. But I would say to make it as simple as possible, meeting your steps goal and meeting your ideal BMI, I think focusing on these two to begin with would, would help a lot in reducing a lot of costs for the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So Mashari, you're obviously an expert in health technology. Why would you recommend that people maybe get something that allows them to track their digital health in the new year and going forward in 2021. So the idea behind that is that we're shifting from a reactive healthcare model to a proactive healthcare model. We're shifting from sick care to healthcare. So we need to play an active role in the healthcare system and start helping healthcare professionals because the current healthcare system is underutilizing patients. And by using these technologies, we can definitely help stay well and live better and improve our quality of life and health outcomes over time. Excellent. And at the fact that we've got ability to have feedback, to know that the changes we're making in our lifestyle are having a market impact on our health, that's pretty valuable. And that's a luxury we didn't have a long time ago when I first started in this field. So thanks for taking the time, Ashari, and sharing your knowledge with us. I'm sure some people got some good ideas for Christmas presents and holiday presents for the new year. Amazing. Thank you so much for having me. That was Dr. Mashari El Washmi talking about health technology and the role it can play in our personal wellness. When we come back, we'll be talking with Julie Dwyer, who's an expert in mindfulness about staying in a healthy state of mind over this holiday season. We'll be right back. The holidays are a time that's characterized with being merry and full of joy, but that isn't the case for everyone. For a lot of people, the holidays can be hard, especially this year with our restrictions around the pandemic. To talk to us today about this important part of holiday health is Julie Dwyer. Now she holds a master's in science in clinical psychology from the University of Edinburgh and has been studying and practicing mindfulness for a decade. 
to help with the challenges that some people face during the holidays, and to keep others in a positive state of mind, she created a free weekly online meditation and mindfulness group for the month of December. It's an amazing gift to the community and a great opportunity to develop a regular practice or to create some connections over the holidays. As you'll find out, she's a huge advocate for health and has recently co-founded a fitness business called Pulse Beret Fitness outside of her full-time role as a healthcare professional. Let's check it out. Welcome to the show, Julie. Hello, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy you're here too. Uh, And I think it's such an important topic. You know, the holidays are upon us. It's going to be a little bit different this year. But in general, you know, the holidays, people think of them as being this happy, merry time. That's the way it's advertised. But that's not necessarily the case for all people, is it? No, I think that there is a stereotype of it being the most joyous time of year. And we see it in the malls and in the movies and everything is surrounded by Christmas. But if you're experiencing any negativity, any loneliness, any sadness, that is amplified during the holiday season and it can get exponentially harder than it already is, especially this time of the year, this particular Christmas, given the pandemic and the new normal. Mm, Exactly. It's it's a change for a lot of people. A lot of people can't travel and, and a lot of people aren't coming home. I wanted to reach out to you and talk to you because you have a background in this. Can you walk our our listeners through what you've done for training in this field? Uh, Absolutely. So I went to MUN for my undergraduate degree in psychology, where I was first introduced to the concepts of mindfulness and self-management. That is when I started my own mindfulness meditation practice um, personally. Um, Later, a few years later, I ended up actually in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh, which was my dream come true to go to that school. Charles Darwin went there, J.K. Rowling went there. So it kind of was feeding into my Harry Potter dreams to attend there. Um, And I studied clinical psych, a master of science under the supervision of Dr. David Glanders. And I dove even deeper into mindfulness um, during that time period. I looked at mindfulness-based interventions for anxiety um, and worry as it relates to generalized anxiety disorder specifically. Since I've been living back in St. John's since the past about three years now, I have a day job at a local hospital where I use a lot of those meditation mindfulness um, principles incorporated. But that is my academic background, but I like to apply it to my outside life using fitness and meditation, yoga, all that kind of stuff in my day to day to help my own mental health. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you know, and you're, you're an athlete too. Well, I've done marathons officially. I ran a marathon. My first one was in Iceland. Uh, and then last year I ran one in Switzerland, which was with my dad. And it was amazing. Well, the one in Iceland was with my dad too, actually. He's an amazing runner and he got me into it. Um, so then this year in 2020 was the year of the ultra marathon. I trained for 10 months so hard, so many sacrifices. And then a month before the race. The pandemic naturally canceled it and other COVID casualties. So I didn't actually run the race, but I did do all the distance and feel good about it. But hopefully 2021 races will make a comeback. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You said it, COVID casualties, which is why this holiday season is particularly hard for people. What are some of the things that you're seeing in your practice around people's anxiety around this holiday season in particular? I think that this holiday season is a lot different than any other holiday season because we're living in a new normal. And eight months ago, when the pandemic first happened, I don't think any of us pictured being here by Christmas. I'm not sure if Christmas even entered my mind. I I just thought maybe this would last for a couple months. And we've had to adapt day after day, month after month, and so quickly to different changes And Christmas is that thing that's usually so traditional. And we have, I mean, I can tell you, I do the same thing for Christmas every year since I was a kid. And this year I I live in St. John's, my parents live in St. John's, so I will get to see them. But my, you know, the big holiday parties and those traditional things, those are different. So anybody that relies on that connection to get through the holidays won't have that. And again, like you said, you won't be able to come home to see your mom, your family. There's so many people that aren't going to have that connection and the holidays are tough. And then that social isolation and the physical distancing after eight months, it's, you know, it's kind of worn off that, you know, maybe in March, April, everybody was having happy hour on Friday night with their zoom family and their zoom friends, but nobody wants to spend Christmas like that. 
but that, that's where we are. And that's what we have to do to stay safe this year. So it's kind of trying to find new meaning within this uh, pandemic Christmas. It'll definitely be different. Um, so we shall see how we all adapt to it. <laughs> well, I, actually, are there some things that people should be sensitive to one another for this holiday season in particular when it comes to like, maybe you're having a great time and you're surrounded by people, but uh, what are some triggers that people should be conscious of when dealing with other people? I think that just being very careful of your wording, first and foremost, being kind. Uh, You have no idea what someone else is going through. You know, going into the mall, it's so hectic trying to find parking. It's so easy to get frustrated by the littlest thing. And I am so guilty of that myself. I went to the Avalon Mall yesterday and it was an absolute nightmare just trying to park and get in. But instead of getting caught up in those minute to minute frustrations, you have no idea what that other person that's in front of you taking forever in the lineup is truly going through. They may not have anybody this holiday season. They may have lost a loved one to COVID. There's, you know, there have been some deaths in our province. There are still people experiencing COVID. And we, some of us see it as an inconvenience. Oh, I can't go to my party. I can't do this. Oh, it's ruining Christmas. But some people are fighting for their lives and we don't know who's who. So we have to approach everybody with kindness and compassion this year. I mean, I think it's probably a general rule to try to do that every day, but especially this Christmas, I think it would be so beneficial if we could all just try to be a little more understanding of each other and just a little more compassionate. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a Newfoundland and Labrador thing to be like that anyway. So, you know, just a little reminder for all of us just to be a little bit more caring of our neighbors and, and keep that uh, sort of spirit of the holidays in our hearts. Uh, that that would be important. Um, for people that uh, that want to try and cope better over the holidays, what are some things they can do to keep themselves in a good mindset? I think that it doesn't have to be big changes to try to get through this Christmas and cope in a healthy way. I think engaging in just healthy habits, whether it's getting enough sleep, trying to fuel our bodies with good food, getting some fresh air. I mean, we were talking about me running. You don't have to run five miles to feel good. You can just go walk around your block, maybe give out Christmas cards, try to connect with people in your community as much as you can If there's a good Christmas movie you love, watch it on TV. But there's also lots on the go. Um, I've noticed some organizations putting out some socially distanced kind of Zoom stuff. And people are trying to get creative this year in how they can create connection. So I think taking advantage of some of that stuff and maybe trying to create some new routines. So maybe you won't get to go to your relatives for that special meal, but maybe you can look up a recipe and plan out the grocery shopping and that can be an ordeal and then make the meal yourself and just take a new approach to it. And I think having an open mind will be very beneficial this year, given all of the new normal, new regulations that we are going through as a society. Yeah. I mean, and people have adapted. I remember they've adapted to exercising at home and I still do Zoom workouts. And and uh, and so, yeah, it might be a good year to add some new traditions that you didn't have time for before because our, our social schedule was so busy yeah. in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Every Christmas, I might. So I have a really tight group of friends. And we they mostly live away now, but we spend all of our time together during Christmas. And we have all of these healthy habits that we want to do over Christmas. Oh, we're going to go for a hike and we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to eat this and all of these healthy things that are supposed to happen. And then, you know, you stay out until 1am and you wake up the next day. It's really hard to do those healthy things. So at least maybe with the limited social gathering, we will have more time to spend on healthier habits. And when we can choose to try to look at the silver lining, it will be easier for some of us than others. I mean, this whole quote that, yes, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat type uh, idea. So just keeping that in mind going forward, I think it's so important. I'm here with Julie Dwyer, mindfulness expert. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. We're talking mindfulness during the holidays with mental health expert, Julie Dwyer. Let's get back to the interview. Well, one of those healthy habits people can add in is mindfulness, and you have developed a little gift for the community. Tell me about that. Yes. this uh, It occurred to me, actually, when I was on a run last week, uh, I was trying to think uh, how I could 
give back, but also create some connection. I was feeling myself just a little bit bummed about how my own Christmas was going to be different this year. Um, and then I decided I wanted to maybe offer a community meditation. And I was trying to think about the best way to do this. And I think Zoom, obviously, given the social distancing restrictions, was the best option to take. And I wanted it to be accessible. There are some meditation programs you can do in the city, online, um, outside the city, in different businesses and organizations. But they all tend to cost money. And some of them can be pretty expensive. So I decided to make this as accessible as possible and make it free um, to get as many people involved as possible. So I had just initially didn't expect much of it. I thought if anything, I'd get a couple of people to hold me accountable to meditate once a week. Um, and so I finished my run and I just shared it on my own social media, on my Instagram and said, I think I want to do this meditation group once a week on zoom. Here's my background. I've been meditating for 10 years. I have a master's in psych that focused on mindfulness meditation for anxiety. And I'm going to do this on Zoom. Reach out to me if you're interested. So I was hoping maybe like two or three people would reach out to me. Within a couple of days, like 95 people had reached out to me. And it was people I knew, a couple of my friends, some of my friends. Um, and then it also was a lot of strangers. And it was people from BC, from Nova Scotia, from Ontario, from all over that just, I mean, the nature of the internet and social media, it being shared. And then as I we've mentioned a couple of times, I uh, run a little bit. So I shared it with a running group and then a lot of runners got sent the link. So it kind of grew. Um, so at that point, I thought maybe I'd encourage people to make a donation to some local organization if they had the means to do so. No pressure by any means. Um, but just that if someone was feeling generous, that instead of paying for the meditation, they could make a donation. So then I was getting lots of gorgeous, lovely, wonderful stories of people donating to food banks and Stella Circle and the Canadian Mental Health Association and just so many organizations within the city. And I had one woman in Ontario who donated in my name to a couple organizations up there. And it was just so lovely to hear all this because there are so many people hit hard by this pandemic. So many people were out of work for so long. Our economy, now I, that is not my wheelhouse. I don't know much about the economy, but our economy is not in a good place. The work is not the oil industry. There's so much struggle right now that these organizations are at their capacity and they could use our help too. So I thought, why not two birds, one stone type thing, try to create connection by doing the mindfulness and meditation piece, but then as well, try to give back on a bigger scale to some of the organizations that are helping out many of the vulnerable people in our community that this year are going to be left even more vulnerable, unfortunately. It's so true. We had a thing on for the Canadian Cancer Society and they're so far behind the donations just because the means aren't there for people. But but it's it's awful generous for you to be able to donate that time and, and be able to help people as well. And so that's very karmic. And the fact that you can do some good for other people that need it as well. Why is mindfulness so important? What does it do to us if we become more mindful? Mindfulness, it people, it's... <laughs> On a simple level, my being mindful just simply means being in the here and now. And then you hear that and you think, how can something so simple be so beneficial? But taking a mindfulness approach, it means paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. So to break that down a little bit, paying attention to what's going on around us, um, trying to increase our awareness of the experience of the here and now while being curious and objective and without judging it. So kind of trying to see our thoughts just as passing clouds in the sky instead of getting tangled up in them and getting too fixated on stuff that happened yesterday and last week. That's kind of where all that depression type stuff comes into play. And then if you're like me and you're a chronic overthinker and you analyze every possible situation in the shower and imagine all your arguments here. Yeah. It's uh, there's a lot of us that are like that. We uh, we're always thinking about the future and that can be beneficial. We have this doing mode as humans and the doing mode allows us to get stuff done. For example, you with this show and me, I'm going back for my PhD in September and I'm so excited to do that. And it's that doing mode that enabled me to get to this place to do those things, but just as much, it can be detrimental if we don't just simply allow ourselves to be. 
because constantly analyzing, constantly trying to problem solve leaves us with a pervasive sense of dissatisfaction if we don't get those solutions that we want. So learning to simply observe, learning to simply be without judging ourselves, without judging other people. It's just so beneficial learning to accept our reality as it is. And I just want to break that down a little teeny tiny bit for a second, because some things I've heard before is how can you accept your reality if you don't like it? Yes. For example, Christmas this year, you're not going to get to go home. That sucks. You don't want to accept that. Or maybe you lost your job or maybe recently you've received a really terrible diagnosis or you've lost a loved one. Those are very, very hard realities. We don't want to accept those realities. Likely we wouldn't choose those realities if we could. So maybe if we change the word acceptance in that case to dropping the struggle instead of actively fighting against it, maybe we'd learn to sit with it a little, make you know, peace with it, lean into it, open up to it, expand around it. And eventually, this is a process, this is a practice, we will learn to embrace it. And that's not going to happen overnight. And it's not going to happen once after meditating with me on a Thursday night. But if you practice it a little bit every day and you practice it and you keep coming back, you will learn to embrace a lot of the hard things. And that's on a personal level, why I really connected with meditation and mindfulness myself and what led me to dive so deep to do this in, as a PhD is because it builds resiliency. It allows us to see the world without being tangled up in our own thoughts. And it makes the hard things a little less hard. It gives us that those tools in our toolbox that when the hard things come and the hard things do come, and sometimes we see them coming, sometimes we don't see them coming. And this pandemic, nobody saw it coming. No one saw this new Christmas to be this way. I certainly didn't. Um, But having these tools in our toolbox as people give us just those coping skills and the ability to do a little better when we're faced with challenging things that we don't choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have impact bias and we overanalyze something. We tend to make it better or worse than it really is, you know, and, uh, and sometimes it just is. And, uh, and so, you know, dealing with that and learning how to deal with that is, is pretty important. I think for people now, you exercise a lot, and that's obviously a huge part of your life, as is your study and research and work. But how is exercise beneficial for maybe some people? Because some people can't sit down and, and really get into meditation. They're not there yet. They don't want to do that yet. But how can exercise help our mental health? I like to say that movement is medicine. I have a little fitness uh, side hustle, and uh, that's something I say. You're usually only one workout away from a better mood. And obviously everyone is in a different place and everyone's fitness levels are in a different place. So it doesn't need to be anything too crazy and you don't need to, you know, swim to Bell Island or run a marathon to get some exercise. You can simply go out of your house and go for a 10 minute walk. Mm. That's your starting point. Maybe you do five minutes out, five minutes back. And maybe after a little while of doing that, you do 10 minutes out, turn around 10 minutes back and you build up. So if people want to get a hold of you to participate in your project, how can they do that? So my email is jdewire, D-W-Y-E-R, 709 at gmail.com. So jdewire709 at gmail.com. If you are on Instagram, it is J-U-D-W-Y-E-R, Dwyer. That is often where I share a lot of my information and insights surrounding that uh, fitness and meditation and such. So if you want, I'm not, I kind of made a point to not mass send out the link. I do have a, it's set up so that there you're put into a waiting room and have to admit you into the call, but just with so many people and just given the nature of zoom this year, I didn't just want to put it out in the universe. No. So I prefer if people were interested um, to email me or Instagram me and I will gladly send you the link. No charge. As I said earlier, And I've had tons of people don't feel weird if you're a stranger and we've never met. That is what this is for. I'm happy to send the link and I'm happy to talk to you about resources. Some people have reached out to me about developing their own practice and some reading that they can do. And I'm happy to chat about that kind of stuff. Uh, I think it is just so important. Not enough people know about meditation and mindfulness. I know about it so much because I've been studying and working in it for 10 years. But when I think about 10 years ago, when I was introduced to that concept as a part of my undergraduate honors thesis, my supervisor said it, I looked at him like, what? Mindfulness? What? Mm -hmm. So I recognize that 
a lot of people may not know what it is, or a lot of people might have misconceptions of what it is. It's really taken on a scientific lens. And there's so much research done. Harvard actually has its own meditation mindfulness lab right now. And they're putting out so much research on that. And the field is growing every day. Mm -hmm. So I am here to spread the word because I find it very beneficial and not only do I find it beneficial personally, but I've done the research and it is beneficial. <laughs> that's excellent. Well, that's why it's so great you could come on today. So thank you so much for sharing all that important information and for the for what you're providing the community. I think it's an amazing gift to everybody. And I think you're doing a lot of great work with it, a lot of good stuff. So thank you so much. Thanks, Mike, for having me. I'm so happy to talk to you today and to share uh, some insights on meditation and get this program out there. Awesome. Well, happy holidays. Happy holidays to you. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to all of my guests for sharing this holiday health message. Adriana let us know that we can all find balance in enjoying holiday foods. Mishari shared some great ideas around holiday health tech. And Julie reminded us about mindfulness and that today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. And that's one we can all have under our tree this year. Well, I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. I wish you all a healthy and happy holiday season. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Wellness and Healthy Lifestyle Show on your VOCM.